while she's setting up. Um, she is the current art critic for The Stranger. She is the only full-time um, art critic for a weekly newspaper in the entire country. I think that is still accurate. Are you say there? You're the only full-time art critic writer for a weekly paper in the country. Yes, still true. So it shows the demise of printed press um, and cultural criticism and the um, importance given or not given. She, her writing has been in Art in America, The Believer, Art News. She's received money from the Warhol Foundation to write. She teaches um, at Cornish um, College of the Arts in Seattle. She's been in the Pacific Northwest and writing um, about art for 14 years. I know you're concentrating on something else. She has a background, do you have an MA or a BA? MA. An MA in English. English. And you studied art history at the same time. And music, music and dance. Interdisciplinary, so after our heart. Um, and she is an accomplished, um, synchronized, nationally ranked synchronized swimmer, which is really impressive as well. Wow. <laughs> and she is a community volunteer and activist, and she's written about this you sent me, th so male uh, pregnancy and transracial adoption, um, as well as other things that are difficult to put into words. So let's welcome, are you ready for us? Yeah. Jen Graves. but I think um, I have some ideas. So um, I want to start with uh, thinking about um, something that I wrote in this week's paper. And I'm gonna read to you something from that. It just came out this morning. Uh, in fact, it went live at 11. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna read to you a little bit from that. And then I would like to read to you from another piece that I wrote that was um, a different kind of review. Um, I want to preface all that by saying that I am a writer about art um, and also what you might call a critic. Um, and those two things can sometimes be at odds. Um, so I have sort of two roles. One is to be um, a sensitive observer of the objects in front of me and to me, that really means um, investigating context. So that's the critic part of things, um, is in other words, the receiver of what I'm looking at. Um, so I, I'm, I'm supposed to be like a, a very well-tuned um, re recipient. That's the critic part. Then I'm a writer, um, and writing about art um, is, complicated. <laughs> um, it is, I think, least interesting when what you're trying to do is explain the art. Um, so it's most interesting when what you're trying to do is write alongside the art, um, sort of like making poems around objects or art experiences. Um, I'm really not 
sure at all that that's what I achieve. <laughs> um, but that is the kind of art writing that I'm most interested in. And um, the second kind of, the second tier of art writing I'm most interested in is what you might consider um, sort of philosophical writing, but written by writers. You all have read theory, I presume. It is, as you might see, not always written by writers. Uh, most often not. And also often you're reading it in translation, which is a weird thing. Um, so reading theory can be like reading obdurate objects. Like it's not like reading writing. Um, so it's my job both to receive the work of art and then to create something um, from that um, moment of reception um, to, to actually make something. And so what I can make uh, is circumscribed by um, conditions that are material and conditions that have to do with more elusive qualities that have to do with who I am, where we are, how language functions, that all that kind of stuff. But the conditions that are material that I can talk about um, and I can also try to touch on the more elusive conditions if you think of some ways to ask me about those. Um, is that a hand? No? Okay. Um, the material conditions are I work for the stranger, right? So I think, you know, I'm, I'm wearing the cloak of that institution at all times um, as ill-fitting or well-fitting as it is in that moment. Um, what is always funny about wearing an institutional cloak is it's not as though you were born in it. So um, there are ways in which I personally sort of um, work against what I perceive to be the institutional cloak of the stranger that you may or may not detect, but for me they're important. And then there are ways in which I try to work as a representative of the thing that is the stranger, right? So. It's an, it's an identity question for me that is kind of evolving and always changing. What it means to work for the stranger. Um, in my estimation, I had uh, about 10 years at daily newspapers before that. My father was a daily newspaper journalist for 35 years. My mother was a second grade educator for 35 years. So I sort of come from a background that makes some sense um, in my career path. I had no idea what I was gonna do and I just ended up doing it, but it ended up making some somewhat genealogical sense. Um, working for the stranger means that I work for a newspaper that, <laughs> uh, <laughs> hmm, in my view, um, balances um, performance with journalism. Um, it's not strictly a newspaper. It's an entertainment site, a site of entertainment and a site of cultural production. Um, not strictly a screen for the projection of other cultural productions, right? Um, the Stranger is not a, a predicated on ideas of objectivity. Um, it is predicated certainly to a fault on ideas of subjectivity, right? So I'm supposed to bring my subjectivity to bear when I'm writing about things in The Stranger, whether I'm writing about race in Seattle or I'm writing about black and white abstract paintings, right? So when you're reading The Stranger, it's always helpful to be aware that you're reading a writer. And a writer is, like I said, just a, like a, a, a mass ball of material qualities that can be quantitatively discussed and qualitative things that we may or may not be able to, to actually pin. So, um, so that's the stranger's, I think, biggest um, difference from, uh, from, say, the Seattle Times or New York Times or something like that. Um, the other thing about The Stranger that interests me is that it's sex positive um, and body positive. 
not that those two things are always the same thing, and not that those two things always get worked out perfectly in the pages and blogs of The Stranger, but that those two things are important to me. The other thing is The Stranger is supposed to be a progressive newspaper in a progressive city. That's important to me. Um, and humor is important about The Stranger. So, and the last thing would be urbanism. So I would say it's a paper that um, is not easy to define, but if you have to define it, you can talk about the body, sex, humor, performance, and cities. It's also the only paper that has full-time art, art staffers. Um, and this used to be, as recently as 10 years ago, not the case, the Village Voice, um, LA Weekly, San Francisco Chronicle, Houston Chronicle, all those papers have laid off all their um, critics and used stringers. And now um, it's, it's, a, it's a very lonely position in some ways uh, and very strange position in some ways. Um, so there's that. Um, another thing it means to work for the stranger is that you work online and you work in print. So when we talk about the death of print journalism, um, for me that is, means nothing but the death of the daily deadline. Uh, words still exist and are still printed uh, on blogs and on the internet all constantly and uh, on Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. It also means I am on Twitter. It also means I'm on Facebook. It means all that kind of stuff. Um, so it means that I am um, tr attempting <laughs> to be connective with my communications. That to me is what it means to try to work for this particular newspaper at this particular moment in history in this particular city. Um, so uh, I post things on, on Slog, The Stranger's blog. I also write things that appear in the paper where we have very limited space and where space is physical so it's determined by the number of ads that are purchased like literally and we don't know how much space we have until like almost after the pieces are due. So every week there's a kind of scrambling situation that goes on, which is all to say that if you only read the print edition, you miss a lot. Um, and which is also to say um, that if you only read the online edition, you miss um, a lot of what's really close to my heart, which is sort of usually, hopefully, longer, more considered, uh, slightly more sculptural objects of writing. Okay, um, all that said. <laughs> um, are there any questions about conditions, uh, ground conditions so far? Okay, you can take your time and think about it, any and all. But um, I want to read to you a piece, um, and I actually have it queued up on my phone, so I think I'll bring it up and then leave up the uh, Vines Fountain. Um, I'd like to, to describe to you a little bit about where I come from, and what I mean is where I intellectually come from. Um, when I went to college, uh, well, just put it this way, there's a bad cliche in uh, contemporary art, which is, if you want to sound like you know what you're talking about, but you don't actually know what you're talking about, the artist to talk about is Marcel Duchamp. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, so uh, warning to all of you. If you want to impress somebody who knows nothing about art, Duchamp is a good place to begin. Uh, if you want to talk to somebody who knows anything about contemporary art, uh, it's a tremendous cliche and quite irritating. So um, that said, I'm going to talk about Duchamp. Um, in Duchamp's, uh, and I always struggle with the consonants of French and English, but his, um, his influence um, really starts to become enormous. Um, in essentially 1975, which is the year that he has a major <laughs> retrospective at the Pompidou of Paris, and um, the year that I was born. Um, well, by the time I get to college, which is in the 90s, early 90s, 
uh, and I'm in the Bay Area. Um, I am faced with a, an art history department that um, is stuck in Duchamp, which, in fact, there is currently a, a, an instructor um, or, or a, a continuing orthodoxy in con considering Duchamp as uh, utterly of the moment when in fact he's like dead and gone and you know all that stuff. So he keeps, he's like a thing that will not die. Um, so, uh, so basically, um, I think what makes him, what made him so interesting for me um, when I got to college was the ready-made. Because the popular understanding of art in our culture is still, still stems from the Enlightenment. And uh, I think you guys have studied Kant, so uh, nod heads if that's correct. Yes? Very good. Um, and so you're, we are all inheritors of this ancient <laughs> and uh, fairly, uh, well, extraordinarily outdated tradition that really doesn't jive with the rest of our um, kind of political or social philosophy, but is very interestingly enduring. And um, I didn't have any art history in high school. I didn't have any in middle school. I grew up in Albany, New York. In fact, I grew up outside Albany, New York, in farm country, where there were no museums. Albany, New York has a museum, an art museum now, but that wasn't the case when I lived there. There was a state museum, and my favorite thing about the state museum was that there was a room that you could go in where they were recreating a thunderstorm mm -hmm. using lights. <laughs> so, uh, no art, none. And I'm not an artist um, in the material sense. I am a worker in language, ideas, words. That's always been the case. So um, I am coming to art from a very stereotypical place, I think, in American culture. Um, I don't, you know, there's no sort of like arts high school in my background. There's no, you know, my mother collected the paintings of the Cone sisters' friends. And no, not, none of that. Um, so it's all learned. And the beginning of that learning for me, um, uh, and I also don't come from a bohemian background whatsoever. <laughs> uh, I come from the most bourgeois uh, family in the history of the world. Sorry that that got recorded just now. <laughs> uh, it's okay. Um, so, um, so I go to school and um, I'm really interested in starting to notice the way um, that there are two kind of separate realms when it comes to art. And I start going to San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and, um, and uh, I somehow encountered Duchamp. I think I encountered Duchamp through um, a professor of mine named Gilbert Sorrentino. If any of you know him, he's a writer. He died uh, not too long ago, but he was tremendously, wonderfully, fantastically awesome and uh, kind of a modernist worshiper in some ways, um, but uh, and also a member of Harry Matthews' group, Ulipo, um, experimental writers, and um, a really interesting man. And he had on his wall a postcard of the Magritte painting that is of a pipe, and with the words in French, this is not a pipe. Um, which of course is, uh, I don't know if many of you have heard of this, but it's a, a work that's titled, the translations are come in different versions, but the, tr the Treachery of Images. In other words, this is not a pipe, it's a painting of a pipe. There's an enormous ontological difference there, right? So um, the beginning of that break between what you see and what you know or think you know, for me, happened there. And um, he quickly, stepped over into Duchamp 
and uh, I ended up writing my thesis on Williams, uh, William Carlos Williams Duchamp and New York Dada. Um, it's a terrible thesis, please don't ever look after <laughs> trying to find it. Um, it basically, um, I was interested because of works that are like the one I've put up here, but a little different. The ready-made is Duchamp's um, contribution to the history of, of art reception in that he said there's good taste and bad taste and then there's indifference and he's on the side of indifference. And I was very, very interested in what this means. And what it means that somebody who is so attached to indifference could be elevated so high in the history of 20th century art. And whether um, we could start to look at the ethical dimensions of that as well, what that meant what the political conditions on the ground were that helped to create artists that wanted to get away from ideas of good taste and bad taste. And once you start looking at that, you quickly start looking at the wars, World War I and II. And um, what Duchamp did, for those of you who don't know about the ready-made, is he took um, mass-produced objects and presented them as works of art. The purest of these were not altered. And I think that's an important distinction. Um, the, the most famous is Fountain, which is a um, porcelain urinal that he tipped up and uh, signed. Tipping it up and signing it are alterations. Right? This is actually not an unaltered ready-made. Um, for me, the most interesting ready-mades are the ones that make no um, appeal to your aesthetic sense. You might think of the comb. He just took a comb and presented it, or a bottle rack, took a bottle rack and presented it. The difference is a bottle rack is actually really gorgeous. <laughs> uh, and a comb is kind of meh. I, I prefer the comb. Um, and again, it's not about taste. It's about what happens when you try to remove taste, or what happens when taste is removed. What happens to you? And how do you decide how to find value? And this became um, a thought experiment for me that I'm essentially still working out. Um, so being a critic for me is not about developing a sense of taste, but understanding why my reactions are what they are. And I certainly don't have a program and I don't have it figured out. Um, Another important announcement to make at this moment is every single thing I say has to do really with me and my ideas and is not a proscription, a prescription for this is how to be an art critic. <laughs> I don't know how to be an art critic. Um, I, I don't know where you would get the answer to that. Um, but I'm really interested in understanding my responses to art and finding ways to make objects in response to those responses that are worth um, your consideration or anyone's consideration. So what I wanna do is really quickly take you through um, a, a couple of pieces of writing. And I'm gonna talk about um, first um, this idea of, uh, of taste and what happens when taste is let go of, or um, when we figure out what, when we try to figure out what we're talking about when we're talking about taste. Um, there's a writer named Jean Claire, who actually was the curator of the Duchamp retrospective at the Pompidou in 1975, who wrote that the era of, of taste was replaced by the era of disgust. So if you start his, thesis is that you start to look at um, works of art in the early 20th century that start to be intentionally repulsive. That the ethics that Kant proposed, where 
beauty is pleasure is the moral good was essentially in the 20th century replaced with ugly and repulsive is cleansing is the moral good. So it just flipped, right? There was a new, uh, a new um, prescription for what was good um, for society and a new program for what art should do um, uh, was his theory. And it's an interesting one and uh, not, uh, uh, certainly not um, inarguable, but, but very, very provocative when you think about um, the way people still respond when they are disgusted. Some people respond to disgust by being disgusted. Some people respond to disgust with a sort of sense of um, so like uh, fired up righteousness, right? And both of those responses are sort of um, two sides of the same coin. And so the question is really uh, what, is the, what is the coin? Like what are, we, what are we really looking at? What are we talking about? How do we decide what art should be and what art isn't? Because if it used to be that art was anything, you could take, Kant wrote that you could take a horrible scene and if you turned it into a, a painting, it was beautiful. So anything that was disgusting was not art. And anything that was horrible could be made beautiful by art, right? So art was the beautifying force and there are there's a long history of critique uh, about that um, and about and it has to do with the difference between what you see and what you know and what you think you know so it gets back to this is not a pipe and for me um, um, another thing that really drew me to Duchamp is his uh, conversation about getting away from the retinal, what he called the retinal. And making a ready-made is essentially taking an object and doing nothing to it except adding a new idea, right? So I want to say that one more time, that to make a ready-made, you do nothing except you do nothing physically you only add an idea to an object. And when you add an idea to an object, you also attach language to it. This is probably where I get interested because I'm a language person and this is my bias. <laughs> so, this would be a very different lecture if you were getting a, a critic to talk to you who had been a painter, or who was a painter, who is a painter. Um, but for me, this is where things start to get interesting and where, where um, we can start I can start writing about art in ways that are about culture and about society and about how we use art and whether we use it um, and what we use it to hide, what we use it to reveal. And um, so that for me is important. So the piece that I would like to read you first um, is the one that came out this morning. and. I think it will, uh, I hope it will help to describe some of the problems that I face when I'm trying to figure out what to do. Um, the um, artist's name is Lori Chambers. Does anybody know her work? Shout out if you do. Wow, not one person? Good. She does not make merino wool hats in port towns in Washington, as far as I know. This is the artist. Um, and uh, I prefer this sort of scrolly thing to a slideshow, because it feels more like life. So I hope this is OK. Can you guys see that decently well? Do you want to turn the lights down? Yeah. Uh, so do the lecturing, that big rectangle, yeah. vertical one. Uh, or note taking, rather. Oh, it's, it went black, so it's restarting. Okay. Is that an invitation for you to sleep? It would be better if you didn't sleep, there. since I'm trying to talk to you. <laughs> uh, but do, do as you will. Um, 
In my classes, I always used to wake people up by name. I wish I knew your names. Not to be mean, but because, you know, I want to talk. We should talk. That's why we're here. Uh, okay. I'm going to read you this piece that I wrote, which is called Black, White, Square, an interview with Lori Chambers about why she doesn't like interviews. Quote, I so desperately want these things to be visual, says Lori Chambers, warning that she doesn't like to talk about her paintings, doesn't want to answer why she's been driven to make black and white abstractions for as long as she can remember, at least since grade school, when a teacher had to tell her to put away the black and pick up any other color or why the paintings six decades later are always squares, or why they're here at all. Like abstractionists before her, Chambers wouldn't use paint if she intended words. She attached only one word to her 10 new paintings and smattering of drawings at Francine Sater's gallery, colon. Sila, the exhibition title, a word that appears 74 times in the Hebrew Bible, and that is the last line of a Gilbert Sorrentino novel, by the way. Um, a word that appears 74 times in the Hebrew Bible, but whose exact meaning and history are unknown. A word that creates a gap where multiple theories can rush in, but none will be a precise exchange for the lost thing itself. Given all this, it's generous and interesting that she agrees to talk with me. Quote, quote, even when I started, I guess I would have to say it was something like a terrible act of faith, she says. Quote, there just wasn't really anything else to do. And there have been times when I have been unable to work, or it just didn't seem to be enough. But I would hate seeing that written down. Quote, why? Quote, I just feel so vulnerable, she says, vulnerably. Quote, it just sounds too like I'm a good person, or a sensitive person, or a mad person to say those things about oneself and why you do it. I mean, I really don't know what else I would do. Coming to painting probably saved my life, and that just sounds so melodramatic. I think I'd rather sound like a biologist." End quote. The paintings at Francine Sater's, where she had her first solo show in 1994, and her most recent one in 2008, are not quite on the wall, not against it, anyway. They stand about an inch and a half out from it, each labored over square, each one a field of black and white built up and scraped and scrubbed away, made on a terribly thin panel, almost as thin as a cracker. The depth of that unseen hollow cavity between a stretched canvas and the wall turns out to be so reassuring, but Chambers doesn't allow the reassurance. Frank Stella, circa 1959, great modernist believer in flatness over illusion, would be pleased but it does not feel like 1959 looking at Chambers' paintings. For a few years now, I've wondered how she does this, how she keeps my attention right here and now, using so few tools, colon, black, white, square. They are not untitled. They are just not titled. There are more literal tools that litter her studio. Rulers, straight edges, pencils, paint, sheet rocking knives, rubber mallets for spreading, razor blades, rags, green scrubby kitchen pads. There's the occasional art paintbrush, but more often she buys tools at Napa Auto Parts. Each painting is extremely refined, even rarefied, its own world completely separate from ordinary concerns. But each one is also a messy construction site. What's being built? Unlike when I visit a more narrative exhibition, I write copious notes when I'm in front of Chambers' paintings. I want to remind myself before I forget the tiny flickers of pure white that spring up like surprise flames in fields of dirty, dusty, scraped over whites. I momentarily indulge the idea that a scratchy black, <coughs> a scratchy black area looks like the aftermath of someone trying to escape a prison cell. Quote, but it isn't. Nobody desperate is meant here, I also write down. There are thickly frosted sections, corners where paint has been pushed and piled up against a hard edge. Why? I see architectures, black areas signifying hallways with the lights out. Why is there a glob there? Partly erased lines and smears turn the surfaces into halted stop motion animations with all the frames layered on top of each other at once. An unrelated idea pops into my mind. Quote, is the zebra a white animal with black stripes or a black animal with white stripes? Stephen Jay Gould wrote in an essay about the human drive to categorize things which, in the case of the zebra, apparently turned out to be very difficult for science. 
Are chambers multi-layered paintings black first or white first? Their backgrounds and foregrounds shift and shuffle like cards as I look. It would be impossible to decide, yet it's impossible to stop wondering. Sometimes the stripes look out of alignment, like one half of the painting has been shifted upward or downward from the other half, but the perfect alignment of certain areas always reveals this to be illusory. If each painting is a sovereign territory, one wonders about the governing intelligences. Whatever they are, it's clear to me that I won't be receiving their instructions on stone tablets. Or from an interview with the artist. The only questions she can really answer are ones like, quote, do you ever use your fingernails? No. I remember years ago reading an anthropologist talking about a language, oh, this is her, quote, I remember years ago reading an anthropologist talking about a language versus a sign system. And they said that with a language, you could say no to reality, she says. I just don't think you can do that with purely visual art. I think that if you strip out the words, you kind of have to tell the truth. I think the responsibility of a painter, well, it's our responsibility, but I don't know exactly how to do it. We're kind of responsible for where your eye goes, end quote. It is impossible, she says, to misunderstand something visual. The scale of the pieces is that they are, I believe, 36 by 36 by, yeah, 36 by 36, uh, and thin as a cracker. <laughs> um, she used to do some 48 by 48, but they're, they're, these are 36 by 36, so three feet. Um, and to give you some sense of process, um, it's important to me to, in the absence, okay, so backing up slightly, in the absence of dictated taste, good or bad, which again, I also fall on the side of indifferent when it comes to matters of taste, not interested in taste, um, but I am interested in being interested in taste, if that makes sense. Um, but basically, um, in the absence of dictates, I look for context. So I try to read objects in their conditions and I try to figure out the conditions, um, which can include anything from how they were made, when they were made, why they were made, what they're made of, to what the artist had to say, although that's a tricky one, um, to uh, any zebras. I mean, whatever sort of comes to mind that seems to be part of their context um, that I can plausibly consider part of their context, I like to consider. And I think of myself as a researcher in those terms. So when I'm doing the critic side as opposed to the writer side, although some of this work happens while writing, but, but in the critic, part of the role is research. And that, it, that is part of what I hope um, makes me a sensitive recipient. Um, is my desire um, and effort to track down stuff. <laughs> um, so when I go into a show, however, what I do very, very first is go to the objects or texts, or what, uh, if the objects are texts, in other words. I, I go to the primary material very, very first, and I try to do this on purpose. Because if you go to, it is so easy to, to lose your opportunity to have a first impression once anything else gets in the way. Um, which is why iconic museum architecture is so difficult. <laughs> um, because it's always there before you get into the galleries. For instance, if you go see something at the Guggenheim, you're already in this Frank Lloyd Wright spiral, but that's a whole other matter. Anyway, um, I do try to go see the objects first, so in this case, what I did and what I've been doing for a while, I've, been, I've never written about Lori before, and I've, I've seen her work and always wondered how she's making me interested, because um, I am not necessarily, in fact, I am, fairly disinterested in work that tries to be disconnected. In other words, 
um, there's a lot of abstraction that is just basically a bad, um, a bad inheritor of I'm going to put my emotions on canvas by throwing them on there, right? Like, um, and this seems to me to be an entirely specious and antiquated act. So the idea of her just using paint and um, just, you know, it's not something I'm necessarily predisposed to want to like, um, but I'm always interested in her work and I don't know why. Exactly. So this was an attempt to track down some, um, some propositions in response to my first impressions with these, of these objects. Um, so, and if you want to, we can talk a little bit about why I take more notes when I'm not in front of narrative work than when I am in front of narrative work. Um, but there is a review in last week's New Yorker by Peter Sheldahl. It's actually a really nice piece of writing about a New York abstraction show right now that says, essentially, when you take the narrative out of paintings, narrative springs up around it. And I think that's partly why I take so many notes when I'm standing in front of something like that. Um, it's just a human response. I'd like to read you um, another piece um, and... Uh, this one is a very different kind of review. Um, it's a review of an exhibition at Seattle Art Museum. Um, one thing that happens at museums is you're looking at already vetted material. Um, so when Roman art from the Louvre comes to Seattle, I'm not certain it's, there's any relevance to me discussing that the forms of the sculptures uh, echo the traditions of the who cares, right? You, what is interesting is why are these objects here? How are they presented? What is happening in these rooms? How are they talking to each other? Not this stone is carved in the, I mean, if that is part of what's interesting, great, but there's no point in me formally doing an aesthetic, a purely aesthetic review of those objects that have been vetted for centuries, right? This is, it just makes no sense. Um, so I have a different job, and that's more cultural critic when it comes to museum exhibitions. And it's, it allows me to ask the question, okay, why do we think these objects are valuable enough to be presented in this way, and how are they presented? This review is called Glossing Over, Glossing Over Upheaval and Violence. It was published October 19th, 2011. Um, the subtitle is Sam's New Asian Art Show is an Indignity. So, I loved it. Uh, Seattle Art Museum's big new exhibition of its world-renowned Asian art collection, Luminous, The Art of Asia, is having its homecoming celebration after the more, more than 150 pieces traveled across Japan last year. The objects themselves are the simple part. There are six century clay armored warriors excavated from a Japanese tomb, 12th century Chinese paintings on silk. One is a pheasant crying out, trying to escape a hawk. And 16th century Vietnamese ceramics discovered after a shipwreck. There are Indian miniature paintings in vivid watercolor, ink, and gold on paper. Ganesh, looking smart as ever. Vishnu, with his lady on his nose. There's a 13-story pagoda sculpture made in slimy, shiny, green, brown, and blue enamel pottery. There's a Chinese ewer that's also a phoenix, a thousand years old. Japanese screens are painted with poppies, bamboo, crows, greeny ocean waves. Chinese robes bear dragons chasing flaming orbs. A Korean bojagi, or translucent patchwork cloth for wrapping, is possibly the most delicate thing ever hung on a wall. There's calligraphy and Thai ceramics, and a room where videos demonstrate new ultrasound scans of ancient sculptures, and there's also a new sculpture installation of an almost unbearably beautiful life-sized gate made of sheer fabric, stitched with celadon-colored thread, with a video projected onto it by the contemporary Korean-born artist Dohosa 
creator of the dog tag robe that's so popular in the contemporary galleries at Sam. The rest is confusing. Stay with me. Asian art is central to Seattle, though you'd be forgiven for not knowing it. Luminous is on the top floor of Sam's downtown location. On the floor below, Sam has a row of galleries regularly devoted to Asian art, currently occupied by, team, by B Team material. Sam also owns the Seattle Asian Art Museum a few miles away in Volunteer Park, currently occupied by B Team material, and soon two new temporary exhibitions. Still with me? Good. The inside story of Asian art at Sam and Sam, I suggest pronouncing it Sam, through the years and across the shifting complex geography of Asia is doubtless fascinating. It started in the early 20th century with the founder of Sam, who traveled to Asia, loved Asian art, collected it well, and began a serious ongoing commitment at the museum to acquire and care for great Asian objects. The quality of the collection and its physical maintenance is excellent. The objects you'll see in Luminous are great, in great shape. But the curatorial stewardship, the intellectual, social, and spiritual care of the collection is dead in the water and has been for some time, with few exceptions. Former SAM director Mimi Gardner-Gates was an Asian art scholar, but her tenure did little to strengthen and deepen the relationship between the people who live in the city and the trove of Asian art right under their noses. Shows at Sa'am are often dully framed, siloed, and under-promoted. Gates' influence is ongoing. Though she's retired, she's begun something called the Gardner Center for Asian Art and Ideas at Sa'am, which appears to be her own fiefdom, another silo, disconnected, offering scattered lectures and events. And Luminous is another disappointment, even something of an indignity, despite the exquisite moments you can happen upon with individual objects. The exhibition's curator is Catherine Roche, an interim curator at the museum, which makes you ask, why is an interim curator presenting the museum's most prized material in a splashy exhibition? Roche makes a big deal out of the theme of migration, but why this theme is not reflected in its hollow title, Luminous, I have no idea. Migration implies the crossing of regional and national borders, and several of the wall texts make reference to violence in history, to the profound loss of context that accompanies objects that travel across time and miles. Labels remind us that these objects have been ripped from their cultural, religious, and geographical contexts and represented in the flattening illusion of the museum. But the objects are presented sparsely, coldly, and separated. This unartful presentation seems to exacerbate the worst aspects of their provenance and upheaval without taking the opportunity to make a statement about their broken relationship with each other. In several cases, labels further mystify the objects providing pretty rhetoric or statements about the utter mystery of the objects. Not all these myster mysteries are so mysterious, though. At the entrance to Luminous, you're face to face with an enormous 17th century Korean painting of a preaching Buddha. It is, its label reads, quote, one of the most important Korean treasures in the US. The label also says the exact date of production and temple of origin are unknown and mentions its recent travel to Korea for restoration, which demonstrates, quote, a major theme of this exhibition that objects like people are continually in flux, though cr through close scrutiny, whether under a conservator's microscope, a curator's research, or a viewer's keen observation, these treasures of Asian art may gradually reveal themselves, end quote. Or what might help reveal them are facts. Part of why this painting physically deteriorated, it was featured not long ago at Sutton is that it had to be hung outdoors after Japan invaded Korea and destroyed the buildings large enough to house it at the end of the 16th century. Luminous makes no mention of this. A glance at the label also tells you Sam acquired the painting in 1945, kind of a big year for global politics, <laughs> and the year Japan's brutal occupation of Korea ended. From whom did Sam get the painting? A Japanese or Korean seller? What is the real story of this, quote, treasure? Meanwhile, Luminous devotes an entire room to the dreamy, borderline racist theme of moonlight. How about instead a room devoted to the complex history of Korea within Asia, a history with continuing impact, or to why some Asian cultures are represented barely or not at all in Sam's collection? Instead, we get a gloss. The objects, the people who made them, and the people looking at them all deserve better. Um, so that's a very different kind of review. <laughs> Um, and I think now I'd like to um, basically uh, open it up to you. Uh, uh, lights are coming. Okay. 
Um, there's one other thing that I um, put up this morning that I would be, I put up on Slog and I'd be happy to talk about it um, with you. But um, I also wanted to just briefly explain why I put this image up. This is Sherry Levine's fountain, which is after Marcel Duchamp. What she did is take Duchamp's, um, there's the P again, uh, uh, urinal, remake it, you know, make a copy of it, um, presenting it the same way he did in that the upturned uh, posture. Um, but she made it out of bronze and um, this sort of thing that I was describing to you where the, this, the, this um, sacralization of Duchamp has happened. And this is her um, sort of saying, well, what happens if I just, I just make a copy and uh, I'm a woman? What does it, ha what does it mean um, for, in feminist terms when women make copies of male artists or women make critiques of male artists or when women take on art history or, um, so my point in showing this is that um, Duchamp is really just a starting point for me and, and a good one um, because from him a lot can sort of come, which makes him sound like the donor of the sperm of art history and I don't like the <laughs> implications of that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but all apologies for that aside, um, he's an interesting place to start because uh, you can go um, in a lot of directions from him. <laughs> also note uh, along the lines of who is the sperm of art history, um, the current uh, Sam L. show is subtitled Seminal <laughs> Artists in the, why? Why did it have to be called Seminal? I'm just <laughs> asking. Okay. Um, so, oh, hello. That's the answer. Just in time. <laughs> um, so, okay, I've said many things, and I have undoubtedly left some gaps and probably provoked a few questions. Um, I'm going to be quiet so you can you start using your voices. So the question is, how do I find art, or how do artists or pieces find me? Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of, um, there's a kind of machinery around press releasing, right? So uh, when an artist does something that they think is significant, they usually know well enough to send me a note or send someone a note. <laughs> um, you know, dealers are a way to do that, like that galleries send out stuff. But obviously I wanna do more than just receive what I'm given. Um, so um, I tried to just look around and talk to people and ask them what they're looking at and just try to keep my, I mean usually when I find that I'm bored at life, it's because I'm actually not behaving curiously enough. Um, and so I just try to keep that um, antenna up. Um, the, you know, the, there's also the question of how does a work rise to the level of something that ends up getting written about? And um, again, the answer is far from scientific. Um, it's mostly that I just respond to it in, a, there's, there's sort of two bars. I respond to it in a, in a strong enough way that there's something to, that needs to be done. Otherwise, I feel almost constipated in response. Um, that sounds also insane. Like my body metaphors today are crazy. Um, in other words, I have to shit on your art? For, no, that's not what I meant. <laughs> not what I meant. Um, but I have to get something made, otherwise I feel like I, it's stuck um, in me. Uh, so, <laughs> sorry. Uh, awesome. So again, really happy this is being recorded. Um, so, uh, um, 
there's that, uh, and then the other bar that has to be met is I have like I, it has to fit within my life. <coughs> um, you know, I have to be able to find time and space to do it, and. Um, I think that the most difficult thing for me is the feeling that I see much more and respond to much more than I can produce. Um, so I've undertaken some efforts to um, slowly let that leak start happening and one of them is um, on Facebook. I have like 4,000 friends. You should all be my friend. Uh, and uh, I post something called pictures of art I saw today and it's it's like, I, I mean, I've posted like 50 albums, literally 50 albums of 200 images each. I mean, it's, it's enormous, right? It's an enormous trove of things so that you can have a sense of being reminded like that there's art out there and you should go see it and here's what you might see if you put your eyes on it. But also I'm incredibly not pristine about it. I want these images just to be documents of looking. They're not photographs, you know, sort of like, I'm not staging them and I'm not, and then there's Instagram, which I also, which I've recently started using, and those are a little more selective, and they are a little more framed. Usually I am trying to say a little bit of something. Uh, last night I posted something from Winston Walker at an opening for Trimpen, and I posted two different things. One was um, a view of a work he made, um, and that was uh, fairly um, straightforward. The work is you put in a quarter, and a, a, a mirror, a framed mirror, the mirror rises within the frame, and you get to see a peep show of a Thomas Kincaid painting for two seconds, and then it comes back down. <laughs> it's hilarious. Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, I posted that uh, just to amuse people, and then other times I'm like sort of taking an angle, but then I also posted a, a photograph from that same opening last night where you get a fortune cookie. Winston Walker gave out fortune cookies, which is super nice, nothing against Winston Walker, except the fortune is you will have an extraordinary art experience at Winston Walker. <laughs> Worst fortune ever. So I put that on Instagram because marketing is ridiculous. Um, yeah, what else? Yeah. How far field do you go for a bit right? <laughs> as far as zebras? Oh, do I go see? No. <laughs> you see this body, right? Like, I can only be in so many places at once. Um, I just can't. Like, I cannot. Um, mm, occasionally I'll go, but that's terrible. I'm a tourist. I mean, I am a critic in Seattle. And I have had to embrace that over time um, because I. You know, I used to think, well, I should try to get out and, 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 and go to New York and go to LA and go to, I mean, really the question is, where would you go? Where would you not go? Mm -hmm. You know, and I just can't, I just can't. And one of the reasons that I, uh, and this is very personal, but it has to do with me, is that I believe in being part of a, of a, of a civic conversation. Um, so, I mean, my version of the world is, like everybody move closer together, you know? And it, I, I, I mean, that, that's why I believe in cities, you know? It's because then I think we have the opportunity to really talk about what's happening. I, I, can't, I, I, I can't get to what I need to get to, you know? Look, Bellingham sent me something yesterday, a couple days ago, they're doing a big show, it opens in November, um, or at least they're billing it as a big show. I don't know, who knows, it doesn't happen yet. But um, having to do with um, polar arctic things. <laughs> and uh, uh, it doesn't open till November, so my understanding of it will become clearer, I promise. But uh, I will probably get up there for that. But again, I, I am a tourist. I cannot write comprehensively about that museum. You know, so, I mean, I can give you what I see, and that's fine. I mean, I totally love it. But in order to not write as a tourist in my own city, I have to stay in my own city most of the time. Yeah? Why Seattle, what's compelling is the question. I don't know if you remember at the beginning of the talk, she said this is the only job as an art <laughs> critic in the United States. That's literally the answer. 
I would absolutely go somewhere else. I mean, I would have gone somewhere else, right? I mean, I'm very connected at this point. I very much care about Seattle, and it feels like my home base. Um, but, and there's a reason that I don't move to New York and work as a freelancer, uh, is because I think freelance work, while really, really great, doesn't demand the kind of like um, commitment to a situation. I'm like, I'm sort of paper of record. Right, like I, I sort of have to respond to things even if I don't want to. Whereas a freelancer sometimes only responds to the things that they want to respond to, which produces a strange echo chamber effect. And if any of you reads Art in America, for instance, they have a policy that they don't run negative reviews, which makes a certain amount of logistical sense because you can't run reviews of everything in a 200 or, or well, 100 pages of art across America. That would be so stupid, right? And so what you end up getting is a bunch of like lukewarmly positive reviews all in the same tone. I mean, I write for Art in America. It's not that I don't like them. And it's very good in terms of getting artists out there um, who wouldn't otherwise have their names out there. But the point is, as, a, as like a calling, I wouldn't want to do that, you know? Um, so it's partly happenstance, but at this point I feel pretty committed. And it's, it's become part of my philosophy to really be a city, uh, be, a, be, a, be located. Yeah. In terms of mediums, um, what do you cover? Do you cover everything between dance, performance, music? Visual art. Visual art? Yeah. Question is, do I cover dance, performance, music, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I answered visual art. But um, my history is that I started out covering any kind of art that didn't make money. Uh, everything nonprofit was my area. Um, so everything from opera to orchestral performance, so Seattle Symphony, um, to uh, architecture, um, <coughs> to, you know, just not like television, movies, pop music. I've never. I, I, it's just not been my like area of interest as much. It's not that I have like anything you know against it, but I just have been really interested in these other things. And so the stranger still uses me to cover classical music, um, which can be kind of interesting and and like feed my thoughts uh, about art. But the main thing I write about is art. Yeah. I also probably sometimes cover dance. Like for instance, this weekend there's a performance, Catherine Cabin is doing a performance of a, of a production that she created, I'm gonna totally go to you, um, about uh, Nikki de St. Paul, a visual artist. So for me, I can sort of make that happen and the reason that I want to is Catherine Cabin is a really, um, an artist that I'd like to look more into. Yeah. Yeah. The question is, what do I do if I need to prepare to go and see something? I don't know. Um, that's shifting, and it depends on whether what I'm going to see is something that I feel like I have a background in, or whether I don't. So if I, um, if I am going to see thousand-year-old Chinese ceramics or Chinese paintings, um, you know, that's not my specialty. So I'm certainly going to do some reading. Um, and uh, you know, if I am, if I'm going, but but basically, no matter what I'm going to see, I'm going to do some reading. Um, I just like to know more than you know. The question is usually whether I do the reading on the front end or the back end, and I try to keep it to confined to the back end. <laughs> so oh, museums will always send me catalogs with the shows, um, and I read them, and. Um, you know, I try to read them most of the time afterward, unless it's something I really just think I'm going to be underwater on when I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I know that in the fall, you write a sort of introduction <coughs> to new college st students coming in the city. Like, you can look at art in museums like a really straightforward, like, you can go in the same and not pay anything. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, I don't really know how to phrase this best, but what for you like is for 
for young people and for people without an art education, yeah. like the inaccessibility in art, like what is that space of like for you? Or does that, how would you name that? Um, I think the question is about um, the feeling of inaccessibility in art for people who don't have a background in it already. Is that, okay. Um, do, is your question, do I think inaccess the feeling of inaccessibility is real for people, or how, how do you address it? View it in your position oh, in my position, I don't feel it anymore. In my position, I have to fight against people seeing me as an expert, which I don't want to be seen as, and I'm not. Um, but, um, you know, when I, when I, I will say, when I started, and for the several years, I really felt like I was, um, led into a world that I, like, what, you know, was not my world. Um, and I still feel that sometimes. Like, there are certain realms of the art world that I just know nothing about. And, um, like, I don't really know what dealers do with their, like, I, when they, I don't know, like, what it is to be a dealer. Or I don't know what, you know, like, you know, an auctioneer. I mean, I've been to, I've been to auctions, but I don't, you know, I'm not in that world. So, um, and then there's the world of like super high-end collectors, which I have visited houses, but I don't like, that's another world. Like there's many things, but I will say um, that the, I think one of the great things about art is that, um, you know, you really can pursue it. It gets, it feels maybe inaccessible, but it really, really isn't. Like, it's, um, if I can follow my curiosity, so can anyone. <laughs> um, because I really didn't know anything. Um, I don't, is that, is there more that you want me to address? No, that's it. If you think of more, raise your hand. Okay. No, the question is, am I more captivated by what the artist is trying to do, the artist's experience with the piece, or my experience with the piece? And I would say, um, you know, the artist's experience with the piece comes through many filters, um, and I'm not sure that I know how to know it. And um, I'm not even sure I know how to know my own experience with the piece, so to trust that an artist knows their own experience and then knows how to transmit it in a way that I can know their experience, even though I'm not trying to know my own experience, you know. Like, I think, uh, mostly I don't take into account the artist's own experience with the piece, um, but I really like to hear the artist's uh, reflections and explanations and process. And, you know, it's, it's not that I don't want to hear it I, or, or I want to shut it out or I don't think it's relevant. It's that I don't take it to mean the same thing as the object. Um, and there's a, Susan Sontag wrote about um, uh, this essay called Against Interpretation that's essentially about like, um, pr preserving the erotics of the object and the kind of sensual experience of being with a thing as opposed to like explaining it, you know. The, what um, Arthur Danto has written that the, the, the era of taste has been, was replaced, the era of Kantian based taste was replaced with the era of um, meaning. And that's great, except that it also uh, turns art objects into something that's sort of scientific. Like, well, I, or mathematic, actually. Like, I, uh, I saw that thing, it means this, we're done, you know? I, I just don't know that like, that would be interesting to anybody in terms of me being able to like, make a, a written object out of it. So I do take it into account, but I, I, I honestly am not sure that the artist knows the object any better than anybody else. Um, I mean, sometimes they really do, but uh, I really try to resist seeing art objects as boxes into which artists have deposited secrets mm -hmm. and I'm looking for a key somewhere. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think that's a fun thing to do. I think that would be a very simple operation. But the other thing is, um, I once interviewed a, a, an artist who in Portland who, who had been a drummer, and he was like this great drummer, and he was traveling all around and all around and all around, and he loved being a drummer, but he wanted to leave the room and have the drumming still happening. <laughs> so he started making art. So if you think of that, like I think that's sort of 
so that's sort of something I always think of is like, these objects are left behind by somebody who'd like to tell you something in a way other than being in the room with you. So don't think that getting in the room with them and asking them to explain it is a substitute <laughs> for the thing they just, they're trying to do, which was leave you in the room alone with the thing they made. Is it, yeah? Yeah. Yell. So the question is, how do I create my authority and have the confidence to say this is what I thought? Um, and out of respect for time, I'd like to say we can probably only take one more question. Um, but I'll just say quickly, I don't have any authority. Um, and I think that's important. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but in the review of Lori Chambers' work, I asked things like, why is there that glob there? I don't know. All I can point to is the fact that I am wondering um, and that I can't answer it. You know, so I think um, the second half of that question is about confidence, which is like, how do you have the confidence to say what you think? And I, I, I think that's less about confidence and more just like, like for instance, for me, it's not stressful to get up in front of you all and talk, but for some people, it's extraordinarily stressful to get up in front of five people and talk, right? It just, it just is who I am. So there are other things that I'm extremely not confident about, but like, writing down my observations in a way that I hope you'll want to read is like not one of the ways that I suffer from anxiety. <laughs> That's, it's just personal, you know? But I, 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 so, I mean, there are writers who are like cripplingly nervous. And I find it very stressful at times. But usually when I'm scared, it's because I don't know the answer and I'm trying to present it as though I do. You know what I mean? Like usually I'm, I'm writing it. I'm, I'm making a problem for myself by pretending to be an authority in that sentence. And I have to like back out of the sentence and start over and then it, it like makes the authority, or it makes the um, anxiety go away. Like if I just reframe and I'm like, oh, I, I don't actually know the answer. I'm just gonna say I don't know and ask <laughs> um, and try to write that in a way that's, that's interesting. Um, yeah. Okay, so maybe one more? I think you already had one, so I hate to... Did you already have one? No. Okay. I'm oh, I'm you, you can both go. Okay. <laughs> At the same time, please. <laughs> my, my question was about how much pre-writing do you do? Pre-writing? And how much editing? How much editing? Yes. I don't even know what pre-writing is, so I don't think I do it. Okay. Um, <laughs> editing uh, a, as much as is humanly possible. So uh, I am, a, 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 um, for anyone in the audience who is like a writer rather than a, an artist, I am a firm believer in uh, editing like a crazy person. Like I could easily go back in and rewrite those two pieces I just read. I don't think of these as firm at all. And I love that process. I actually like editing more than writing. Um, the like changeability and malleability is really fun. Uh, and, and, and there's so many times when you get, just get it wrong and you look at it and you're like, oh, it's so wrong. I'm so ecstatic that I can change it, you know? <laughs> like, so I love editing and I, do, I will do it till the end of, till the, till the sentences are torn from me and published. <laughs> One more. Um, I mean, the question is, I use the word interesting a number of times, and is it enough for art to be interesting? Um, interesting is not a particularly interesting word. <laughs> um, but the meaning, I think, is still there. Uh, and, uh, you know, I guess the question is fa fairly philosophical. Um, so uh, answering it in one second is going to be tough. But I, I think... It is enough for an artwork to be interesting in the same way it's enough for a person to be interesting. Like, 
you have to determine what constitutes interesting in your context, right? Um, there's a there's a whole bunch of art that's like um, that's like almost a portrait of interesting, like it's quirky, and all quirkiness seems to look the same. Like it involves cute animals who are also maybe robots. <laughs> Or maybe they are a skull with a naked lady sitting on their head. You know what I mean? Like, those are people, artists, trying to be interesting um, and failing to, for me. So interesting is about context. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.